Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. How you doing, church? What an amazing service we have already had. I'm so excited to be with you today, opening up a new sermon series entitled Timelines. Would you say timelines with me? Timelines. Yes. Now, before we jump into our sermon, uh, the message, last week we had the opportunity to see 30 people baptized. Isn't that amazing? Uh, so cool. It never gets old seeing people go from death to life. And last week, we got to see people publicly display that. So amazing. For those in the room that have kids, you're going to understand this next little thing I'm about to say. My kids don't understand time at all. When they say now, now means now. Anybody else kids like that? My oldest daughter is 14 years old, and when she says, Dad, I'm thirsty, what that means is that we need to get in the car and go to Starbucks because she's need a refresher. <laughs> means I got to spend money. <laughs> My middle child, she's four years old. Her name is Bella, and she is a whole mood in and of herself. And when Bella says now, it means, Dad, it's time to play right now. I don't care if you're tired. I don't care if you've been outside all day. Right now. My two-year-old, his name is CJ. When he says right now, it means right now. And the way that he uh, says that to us is daba daba da da because he can't, he can't actually talk. <laughs> But what he's asking for is a snack, because that's what all kids want. Give me a snack right now. Much like my kids and much like much of us, when we say now, we expect and we want now. And waiting on God sometimes can be challenging because of that. Sometimes we feel the need to take measures into our own hands, but what we're going to find out today is that sometimes that don't work out well. The big idea for this sermon series, Timelines, is simply this. What do we do when God doesn't move in our timeline? Habakkuk 2.3 reads this. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of an end time and will, prove, and will not prove false. Listen, there is an appointed time for God's promises to be fulfilled in our lives. We don't always know the timeline, but we can certainly trust that there is one. Though it lingers, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. When we think, or rather when I think of this idea of timelines and waiting on God, I think of the song that my mom would play all the time growing up. It's by a lady named Dottie Peoples, and the song is, He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. He may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. He's an on-time God. You say, yes, he is. Yeah. Can I be honest for just one moment? I don't like that song. <laughs> I don't like it one bit, to be quite honest. Because whose timeline are, is God coming on? Is he working on Central Standard Time? Is he in, like, specific mountain? Like, like, what time zone? And after I started looking up time zones, I actually realized there's, like, 18 different time zones. So, like, 8 o'clock here ain't 8 o'clock in China. So what time is on time? Now, for those who are in the military, you'll understand this phrase, hurry up and wait. Anybody ever heard that before? So you rush all day to wait for three hours. Like, why did you just tell me to be there 30 minutes before? Like, I would have been on time. Now, we're in a diverse room here, which I love. I, I love the fact that our church um, has so much diversity. Um, and with diversity, with people, there comes a diversity of what on time mean, if you know what I mean. You feel me? <laughs> now, for our Caucasian brothers and sisters, when they say 6 o'clock, they mean 6 o'clock. You hear me? Now, you come at 6.45 and the food gone because <laughs> we told you 6 o'clock. Now, for our chocolate folks and for our Latino people, <laughs> six o'clock might mean seven. <laughs> now, I just want to help everybody out in the room really quick. I want to help everybody not be frustrated. So, our Caucasian brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. When a chocolate or Latino person, you know, tells you six o'clock, don't show up on time, okay? They, 
They haven't even thought about what they're cooking yet. <laughs> for our chocolate folks and for our Latino people, let me just tell you, when, when a Caucasian person tells you 6 o'clock, tell yourself 5 o'clock so that you can be 15 minutes early. <laughs> All jokes aside, <laughs> I'm really excited to unwrap the idea of time with you today. We're going to pray, and then we'll jump into uh, the message. Lord, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us and this opportunity we have to gather. Lord, speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Before time began, we read in Scripture that God was. Scripture itself, Scripture as we know it, starts with God. Genesis 1-1 reads, in the beginning, God. If we translate that uh, in the Hebrew, the word is Rashith Elohim, which better translate as before anything, the all-powerful one was. Time begins with God in the beginning. After we realize who the author of all things is, he creates light. In the first day, he creates the atmosphere and the firmament in the second day. And then on the third day, he creates dry ground and plants. And on the fourth day, he creates time by creating the sun, the moon, and the stars. That's how we understand time. By the sun coming up and going down. But understand that before that even happened, time was already at work. Time is created before mankind is even created. Which means that we only understand God inside of time. And although God operates flawlessly inside of time, he is not bound or constricted by time. Why? Because he himself created it. He has chosen to reveal himself to us so that we might understand him better. But understand, he operates and he resides outside of time itself. God is timeless. Genesis 1 and 1 tells us that God is at the beginning. And then Revelations 22 and 13 tells us that he's at the end. And when we read all through scripture, we realize that he operates without restraint all throughout it. When we come to the realization that God might not always match up to our timeline, our trust in him starts to become stronger. I, I got a question for a couple people. So has God ever failed you by, uh, has he ever failed you by a raise of hands? Has God failed you? Has God always come through? Anybody in the room? Yeah, okay. Let's see. Has God ever been late? In anybody's life in this room? <laughs> it feels like he's been late. He's like, is that a trick question? <laughs> Let me tell you, God is never late. When I get to a place in my life when I feel like I might second guess God, because it seems like his timing is off, I oftentimes remember the song that my mom would play. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. He may not come when I want him. He's going to be there on time. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. God has always shown up in my life, every single time. There is no promise in my life that has gone unfulfilled and no prayer that has gone unanswered. And that's the same for you in your life as well. Even though. I don't always understand the timing of God. I have committed this. Even when I can't trace you, I'll trust you. There's a story in Genesis 16 that helps us to understand this idea of waiting on God. Abraham and Sarah wanted to have a child for many years. God promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations, and year after year after year after year, there was still no child. And instead of trusting that God would fulfill his promises, they 
took matters into their own hands. Now, we're going to take some time to read the scripture because there's a lot to digest in it. But each character that we read, we will see their perspective of timelines and how God has moved and will move in their situation and how he'll move in ours. Genesis 16, starting at verse 1. Abram's wife, Sarah, had not born a children for him, but she owed owned an Egyptian slave named Hagar. Sarah said to Abram, since the Lord has not prevented me from bearing children, go to my slave. Perhaps through her I can build a family. And Abram agreed to Sarah, to what she had said. Now, all the guys in the room, on the count of three, I need you to say set up. One, two, three. (laughs) Somebody said set. Nope. (laughs) It was set up. Uh, But really, really seriously, really quick, I want you to underline Genesis 16 and 2. Since the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, go to my slaves, my slave, perhaps through her I can build a family. Let's continue to read. So Abram's wife Sarah took Hagar, her Egyptian slave, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as a wife for him. This happened after Abram had lived in the land of Canaan for 10 years. He slept with Hagar and she became pregnant. When she saw that she was pregnant, her mistress became contemptible to her. Then Sarah said to Abram, you are responsible for my suffering. I put my slaves in your arm. And when she saw that she was pregnant, I became contemptible to her. May the Lord judge between me and you. I think we all saw that coming. Verse 6, Abram replied to Sarai, here your slave is in your power. Do whatever you want with her. Then Sarai mistreated her so much that she ran away from her. The angel of the Lord found her by the spring in the wilderness, the spring on the way to shore. He said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She replied, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, go back to your mistress and submit to her authority. The angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your offspring, and they will too be counted as many. The angel of the Lord said to her, you have conceived and will have a son. You will name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your cry of affliction. This man will be like a wild donkey. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hands will be against him. He will settle near all his relatives. Verse 13 So she named the Lord who spoke to her, you are El Roy, for she said, in this place have I actually seen the one who sees me. That is why the well is called Ber Laoi. It's between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar gave birth to Abram's son, and Abram named his son Ishmael. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. Now, The first person in this passage that has significance goes by the name of Sarah. Her name will eventually be changed to Sarah. But one of the saddest things about Sarah is that she feels like God is leaving her out of a promise. The verse that I ask you to underline, she feels like God is keeping her from having a child. Now, it's understandable why she would feel that way because she wasn't present when the promise was given. You see, in the chapter before, in chapter 15, God speaks to Abram. And when he spoke to him, that was actually 10 years prior to the moment in which Sarah says, you can sleep with Hagar and conceive a child. When that promise was given, Abram was, on, was 75 years old. And Sarah was 65 years old. Now, is there anybody over the age of 60 in this room that's ready to have a baby? You know, we can (laughs) lay hands on you right now. (laughs) I'm not sure in what manner Abram shared that news with Sarah, but I can imagine that he was excited because now he has an heir, he has legacy, right? And if he wasn't excited about the baby itself, he was definitely excited about the process of making that baby, right? (laughs) Maybe they first started off thinking like, wow, God, all this that we've built, we finally will have someone to pass this down to. We finally will have an heir. We will finally have legacy. 
And I can imagine that after year one and no baby, they still held on to the promise, like, it's coming. Year two, still no baby, but they probably was looking around at other people and saying, like, we're next. Year three, I can imagine them saying, well, this is taking a little longer than I thought, but, you know, God promised it. It's going to happen. Year four, year five, year six, year seven, year eight, year nine, what is wrong with me, Sarah must have thought. What did I do wrong? What deficiency do I have that I can't conceive a child? So she must have thought, well, since I can't have a child and Abram was promised a son, well then, maybe I can help build this family through my slave. Have you ever felt like Sarah before? Like you've been overlooked? Like you've been left out? Y'all, we can get on a very bad downward spiral thinking things like what's wrong with me and why am I not included and why can I be a part? I believe that the promise from the beginning was for both Abram and Sarah. I don't believe for a second that God was leaving Sarah out or that she was an afterthought. But we have to understand, like Sarah had to understand, is that God is not working on our timeline. He's working on his. Understand today that you are not being left out. Do you hear me? You're not being left out. God sees you. And every promise that God has for you, it will be fulfilled. You have to believe that. Ephesians 3.14 says that he will strengthen you. And so today, if you come in here and you feel a little weak, you feel a little weary, know that God will strengthen you because his word promises that it will. If you are a little stressed out about things lining up and things working out, understand that Philippians 4 and 19 tells us that he will take care of all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Maybe you feel a little scared about what might come and what might happen. Understand that Psalms 91 and 2 tells us that he will protect us. And if you don't feel like your situation is going to turn out for good, understand that Romans 8 and 8 says that all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I want you to take hold of of this statement right here. A blessing delayed is not a blessing denied. Yeah. We have to be careful not to feel the need to help God out when we feel depressed, when we feel left out. Abraham and Sarah decided to take matters into their own hands. And while the story presents that it was Sarah's idea, let's be honest, Abraham was a willing participant. (laughs) Rather than fully trusting in the promise of God, Sarah and Abraham took matters into their own hands, and they got exactly what they wanted. They wanted a child, and they got it. But though the immediate result was conception, the long-term result was contention. Sarah regrets her decision and is angry at Abraham and Hagar. Abraham gives Sarah full reign to do whatever she pleases, and she treats Hagar so bad that Hagar leaves. Nevertheless, when we take matters into our own hands, it doesn't remove the mercy of God. We move on on in the story to Hagar. She's the next person that is highlighted. And Hagar actually gets caught in the middle of two people's impatience. She had nothing to do with the story. This, this, is, this didn't actually have anything to do with her. But her slave masters were impatient. I wonder if some of us find ourselves in situations that we never caused. We feel stuck. 
after being treated so bad, Hagar runs away. I know she must have thought, like, I don't got to deal with this. I know I'm a slave, but I'm out. <laughs> that would have been me. Or maybe she was from the Bronx. You know you ain't. <laughs> I love my city, folks. As she was running from persecution, Hagar ends up running into promise. Emotionally, she's carrying the weight of the world, but we find out that she ends up carrying the weight of nations. It's a similar promise that she gives, that God gives to Abram, but the, the difference is, is that the baby that Hagar is carrying isn't the promised one. So that contention that we read of, we are still dealing with today. As Hagar is running from persecution, one can only imagine that she's overwhelmed with grief of having to carry a child that she didn't even ask for. She's being punished for doing what she was told to, and then God meets her in her wilderness. God wants to meet with you as well in your wilderness. She has an encounter with God, and it's as if time stood still. Because God meets with her individually. He calls her by name and speaks to her. I mean, can you just imagine how she must have felt? In that day, first off, women were regarded to be spoken to in that manner. But even beyond that, she was a slave. And the king of all kings and the master of the universe stops time to speak with her. Sarah, where are you coming from? And where are you going? I feel like there may be some people who might feel like Hagar here today. And you feel like the world is against you. And you're trying to figure out where you have gotten how you've gotten to this point, and I feel like today that Elroy, the God who sees, wants you to understand and know that he sees you. I don't know what you have come in here dealing with, and I won't pretend like I do, but he does. So the healing that you need, the deliverance that you need, the way out that you need, the comfort, he sees you. And he's willing to meet with you and to give you the promises that you need that align with his word. God's response to Hagar running away with the baby was grace. She shouldn't have done that. She was wrong. But God responds to her in grace. He provides a blessing for Hagar and Ishmael, the baby she is carrying. Now, we move on to the last person that is highlighted in this passage, and his name is Abram. Abram is 86 years old when Ishmael is born, and then the chapter ends. It's not even a resolution at the end of the chapter. There's a bunch of dysfunction, and it just ends. You see... It had been 11 years from when God told him that he would have a father of many nations to that point. 11 years. To the point in which Ishmael was born. And though Ishmael was born and now he had a son, he was not the promised son. Because the son that he would have, Isaac, that son would be in the lineage of Jesus. He didn't know that nor to Sarah. But when we work outside of God's timelines, sometimes we do things that we think is best, but it never works out. Ishmael couldn't be a replacement. It had to be Isaac. God wouldn't fulfill the promise of Isaac, the promised child, for another 13 years. It was a total of 25 years until Isaac would come, the promised one. I wonder today if we are able to trust God enough to wait on his timeline, even if it takes years. 
It's easy to trust him for a day or two. It's, it's even easy if he gives us a date. <laughs> but can you trust him when you don't know when he's going to show up? Remember our verse at the beginning, Habakkuk 2, 3, 4, the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of an end time that will not prove false, though it lingers. Wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. Throughout this series, there's two things that will become clear. When we take matters into our own hands, things don't go so well. At the same time, we will learn that we can't mess things up so much that God abandons his plan or he breaks his promise. Has there ever been a time in your own life where you should have been trusting in God for something, but you felt as if he didn't move fast enough? (laughs) I've been there. In Psalms 37, we read, the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. It's easy to abandon the notion that God will show up at his appointed time. It's easy to abandon our faith when things aren't working out as we planned. But we must remember that our steps are established by the Lord. If you grew up reading the King James, it says that they are ordered by the Lord. There are specific steps in order to follow. We need to learn to trust the process of God's plan in our lives. Now, if you're like me, you want some practical steps, right? Like, I made the point that God is timeless and he's outside of time and his timeline doesn't always match up with ours. Showed you a couple of examples, but what does that mean for me? Well, I'm going to give you three practical steps to take. Now, I really want you to write this down or to type this in your phone, or take a picture of the screen when they come up. Because there's going to come times in your life where you feel like Abram, and you're like, God, I've been waiting year after year after year after year, and your word says that I was going to be healed. Where is the healing? Or maybe you're like Hagar, and you're like, man, I feel like the world is against me, and I don't know how I got here. Do you even care? Do you know where I'm at? Do you see me? Maybe you're like Sarai and you feel left out. There might be some situations where you feel like that. These points will help you, will empower you, will encourage you. The first point is to pray. Philippians 4, 5 through 7 reads, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When you get in those moments where you don't know if you can trust God or not, pray. Keep praying. And pray some more. Because as you pray, the peace of God will surround you. Because as we pray, we realize and we understand that we might not know how it's going to work out, but we understand that he does and that he's working it together for our good. We understand that we're not alone, that he hears and that he sees and that he's there. When we pray, that happens. The second thing that I want you to write down is to prepare. 1 Corinthians 2 and 9 reads, But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor heart of man imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. Understand that the way in which you want God to show up in your life is not as big as the way that he will show up. What God has for you, And what he has planned is way bigger than what you could ever think, ask, or imagine. 
way bigger. Our minds can't comprehend how he wants to bless us and how he wants every promise in our life to be fulfilled. Family, I want you to prepare for the one that has prepared for you. Understand this right here. That Abram had the promise, right? But he had to take steps for the promise to be fulfilled. He had to sleep with his wife, right? So that she could conceive. Whatever you have to do in your life to prepare, prepare. Pray, prepare. The last point is, I want you to repeat it. Isaiah 40, 31 says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Pray, prepare, repeat. As we continue to pray and to prepare our hearts, we will become stronger in our faith and our trust and dependency in him because we'll realize the character of God Leaning and relying and trusting in who he is. So pray, prepare, repeat. Today, if you are here and you resonate with any of these characters, maybe you're like Sarah or Sarai and you feel like, man, I feel left out. Like everyone else is being blessed and God, like where are you in my life? Maybe you're like Hagar and you're like, you literally left me in this wilderness alone. And I don't want to tell you where I came from and I don't know where I'm going, but I'm here. Maybe you're like Abram and you're just waiting. I can relate with that. Just waiting year after year. After year, after year. I believe today that El Roy, the God who sees, wants to meet with you and wants to speak with you. So I want to pray for you right now. I want everybody to bow their heads, but if that's you and you relate to that, I just want you to lift your hands in front of you. A posture of like receiving. Because El Roy, the God who sees, is about to prove himself to you in the situation by showing you that he's here. That he cares and that he sees. Father, we come to you right now in Jesus' name. And we ask you to show us who you are in our lives. Lord, first we just thank you for what you've already done and who you already are in our lives. We know that we have been sealed because of what you've done on Calvary's cross. For those of us that are saved, Lord, we pray right now that you help us to see you, how you're moving and how you're working and how you're going to make everything work out for our good. Help us to be patient and to wait on you. Help us to not be too fast and try to figure out and do it on our own. Give us peace. But even if we don't understand and even if it doesn't work out in our timeline, let it not cause anxiety. We thank you for who you are and we thank you for what you will do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. <laughs> These promises are for everyone who are saved. If today you are here and you say, you know what, I don't know about this God you're talking about. The God who sees, does he see me? He does. And if you have ever wanted an opportunity to take your next step with him, to pray the prayer of salvation and to commit to him, I want to give you that opportunity today. Here at Family Church, we believe Romans 10 and 9. If you believe it in your heart and confess it with your mouth, you shall be saved. So... I want you to pray this prayer with me. Everyone in the room is going to pray it because we're a family. Let's pray. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe 
that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that, and you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.